Okay. What's going on, guys? So to recap yesterday, all right, we, we started uh, a topic of torque and rotational rotation motion. So torque, again, uh, is pretty much going to be the thing that is causing an object to, to rotate. And how torque is provided by a perpendicular force times a lever arm. So don't worry about this little symbol. It's You're just using force like you would here. And R is going to be our distance that the force is away from the pivot point or, or fulcrum or axis of rotation. <clears throat> so a couple things, right? You need to know your forces. You need to know your lever arms. And then we need to be able to establish the directions of our torques. There are two uh, directions that we use. We use clockwise and counterclockwise. The easiest way that I have found to determine that is by once you know where the pivot point is, all right, your your piece of wood, your block, whatever we're, we're talking about moving or rotating, bar, wrench, etc. cetera, um, basically look at it like hands on a clock, okay? Pivot point here extends out to the right. That would be like pivot point extending out to the 3 o'clock. So downward force would cause that to go in the clockwise direction because it would make time go in the right way, 3 to 4 to 5 to 6 o'clock. If you had an arrow upward, that would make this go from uh, 3 to 2 to 1 to 12, which time wouldn't move that way, in which case that would have been a clockwise or a counterclockwise direction. Over here, pivot point. And then it goes downward, like towards 6 o'clock. And now we have a force acting on the right of it. And that would push this time from 6 o'clock to 5 to 4 to 3. It does not move that way, so we call it counterclockwise, or we just abbreviate it as CCW. Now, based on the video from yesterday, okay, um, just kind of going over one other couple of little things here. If this is our pivot point. If you have a force on one side, it's going to cause rotation. If the forces are unequal, right, if I'm going to pull harder with my pinky here, there's still going to be rotation. But if, like on a seesaw, right, if you were to push down, I'm pushing down, right, I'm pushing straight down right above my pivot point, is there any rotation occurring? No. What if I do that same force but just a little bit to the right? You see that there is some rotation, yes? So... In this example, anytime you have a force that is placed on the pivot point, there is not going to be any rotation because the equation for torque is not just force, but it's times lever arm. So lever arm is the distance you have are from your pivot point. So if you're on the pivot point, R would be zero and your torque would be zero. So that's why we just cross this piece out. Next thing you want to do is locate your pivot point and determine, all right, what hand on a clock we're looking at. Going out to the right, we're looking at 3 o'clock. So anything going down is a clockwise, all right? So we label our forces. Then, like a net force problem, you have to know what the total uh, values are for your clockwise torques and your counterclockwise torques. It would just be like looking at a box, right? And you had something like this. And I asked you to find the net torque. You got to figure out what these two things or forces are. You add them together. And then once you simplify that, Subtract those sides. Essentially what we're doing here. So we come across the first force from the pivot point because the aid is canceled out here. Nine newtons. How far is that away from the pivot point? Two meters. Multiply them out, you get 18 newton meters. The next counterclockwise force is four newtons. And that is two meters plus an additional seven. So it is a total of nine meters away. Now, important to note, guys, is sometimes, right, if there's an arrow like this, some people would accidentally in years past say this is counterclockwise and this is counterclockwise and they would put them here, right? That that would seem to be like the biggest mistake is once you, well, everyone seemed to get that part right, labeling them, but some people would accidentally put like one of these over here or switch two of them just because they're kind of rushing through. But you don't want to do that. You want to make sure that you're, they're in the right positions. So you do these guys, there are no more counterclockwise forces, all right, or torques here, so you add them up. You get 54 newton meters on this end. Then you go to your clockwise, you have 5 newtons, and it is 2 plus 7 plus 4 meters away, which is 13. 
So we have a total of 65 Newton meters of clockwise torque. Just like a net force problem, all right, once you have the opposites here, you're going to subtract them. The higher number minus the lower number, you're going to get a leftover remainder here. That is going to be your net torque. And the direction would be in the value that had the greater magnitude, right? So clockwise had the larger number. That is why it's a clockwise uh, direction here. The next part of the video, they move the pivot point all the way to the outside here and then ask you to re redo this. When that happens, okay, pivot point, and then it extends out to the left like nine o'clock, anything going up would move it in the correct way. Time moves, so that we would call that clockwise. So I'm labeling my upward forces here clockwise. You have your downward forces, therefore, counterclockwise. Same process as we did up top. All right, find their torques, add them together, then subtract the net values there to get your final. And then we're talked about rotational equilibrium. All right, so it's at rest or if an object is rotating uniformly, the net torque is equal to zero, which means your counterclockwise and clockwise torques have to equal each other. All right, they need to be balanced. In this problem, they had a seesaw that was 3.2 meters long. Pivot point was at the center. So right off the rip, there, that's an additional piece of information. If the pivot point is in the center and the whole thing is 3.2, that means each, the length from the pivot point to either end is 1.6, all right? Even though they don't list that there, that is something that you need to make sure that you are aware of. They say the girl is sitting at one end, okay? Arbitrarily, I just put them over here at the left side. Could have been on the right side, whatever, we could have reversed the drawing, but this is how they did it in the video, so I just copied suit. Okay, so she's all the way at the one end, which means she's a full 1.6 meters away. Then we have a 670 Newton boy at some distance away so that the whole thing balances, which means the torques have to equal each other. So pivot point in the center, I drew it out to the left. A downward force is telling me that that is counterclockwise. Out to the right, this downward force is telling me that it is actually clockwise. Okay, so you got to set them equal to each other. We have three out of the four possible variables. Multiply these two together, all right, and then divide both sides by this 670 to get this value. All right, R is 1.8, I'm sorry, 1.385 meters. So that would be the distance that this kid needs to move. All right, or be away from the pivot point in order to get them to bounce. Okay, and now they have a new guy. A new guy is coming in. Now this dude sits 0.4 meters from his own end. The girl didn't change. She's still all the way at the end. So again, pivot points in the center, both sides are 1.6 meters. If he's 0.4 meters in from the end, that means, all right, 1.6 minus 0.4 gives us a lever arm distance here of 1.2. But now we just don't know what the boy's weight is. So have three out of our four variables, multiply together, divide out. This boy would weigh 773.3 repeating newtons. Okay, in this last example, you have a railroad tie that weighs 920 newtons, 2.6 meters long. How much force would be required to lift it, lift it off the ground? 920 newtons. All right, it's got to equal its weight if you're lifting it off the ground uniformly. Okay, now to lift one end and rotate it uniformly. So again, uniform here, the torques need to balance. Wait, how the hell is there a torque if there's no force acting on it? Well, you have the weight of this uh, railroad tie. And <clears throat> they mention it in the video for a geometrically shaped object like a rectangle square right so or a, so a piece of wood box something circular we always all right are going to say that the weight is concentrated at its center so that is important because of that the weight of this railroad tie this 920 newtons is located at the dead center dead center of 2.6 would be all right half of it 1.3 so there is a torque being produced here just by the weight of it. 
they're saying, all right, go to this end and lift. How much force are you going to need to get this thing to rotate uniformly? Well, to rotate this thing uniformly, we're going to need approximately here 460 newtons. Okay, then they said, well, what if we move in 0.6 meters? Move in a little bit. How much force will we need then if I don't feel like lifting it all the way at the end? Well, this didn't change. 920 still at the center, still this 1.3 meters away. If you're 0.6 meters in from the one end and the whole thing is 2.6, you would be having a lever arm here of 2 meters. So whatever the new force is going to be, times 2 is going to equal this 920 times 1.3, dividing out, and you're going to get a value of 598 newtons. So again, thinking about a door, if these are the hinges on a door. When the handle is farther away, it requires less force to open. Right? So, like, this is a, this is how much torque is basically going to need need to be used in order to get this thing to rotate. You need to match it to rotate it uniformly. And if you have a shorter lever arm, you're going to need an increase in force. And we want to make it all right as easy as possible. So we want to apply as less force uh, as possible. And by doing that, that's why we have our handles on the farthest ends away. Okay. So that is pretty much a recap of yesterday. Now, our assignment today, which you guys should have up, I posted on Google Classroom, is our balancing lab. All right, balancing act virtual lab. When you go and click in there, you can open this, guys. You can open this up, make yourself a copy, and then also open up the virtual piece itself. All right, I'm going to walk you through a couple pieces of it, but then you guys are going to go off on your own and complete it. So we want to figure out pretty much we're dealing with rotational equilibrium, getting things to balance and stuff. So describe factors when we can get two different objects to balance and predict how changing position of a mass on this balance will affect the motion of it itself. All right, and use this to find the masses of even unknown objects. So it says, explore the introduction screen. Okay, so this is what the introduction screen looks like when we click on the beginning, right? You click on home screen, introduction. Right now, if we put anything on here, it's not going to rotate at all because we have these two little columns. We don't want them for now. So we're going to click this picture so they get taken away. Going back, okay. Number one, make two same mass objects balance in at least two different ways. Okay, so how can I get two same mass objects to bounce in two different ways? Well, I'm just going to use, right now we only have these five kilogram pieces, yeah? So if I put one, let's say over here at, now I know this says kilograms, guys, but if our equation was, all right, torque is equal to force times lever arm, each one of these little tick marks, I'm just going to say is a meter. So one meter, two meters, three meters, four. And instead of kilograms, all right, we, we're just going to call this, we'll just call them newtons for our force. I mean, take this and multiply it by 10, and you're going to get a, a weight anyway. It would be 50 newtons, but we're just approximately 50 newtons. Um, but we're just going to say... 5 newtons, and then meters here. Makes it easier for us. All right, the concepts are still the same. So if I take one of these dudes and I place it, let's say, at 2 meters on the right side, you see that there's rotation. Well, where the heck can I, where do I have to place this thing in order for it to balance? Logic says, same mass. They have to be the same distance away from the pivot point. So... It says, okay, make two same mass objects balance in at least two different ways. So here's one way. Then you guys, in, in the directions, you're going to have to print screen or screenshot your computer or tablet. So I'm going to just, on mine, it's pretty simple. Control, print screen. On your Chromebook or laptop, all right, if you're not sure how to do that, you're just going to need to Google it. So I just screenshotted mine. I'm going to place the image here.
Okay, that's really big, so I'm going to shrink it down. Okay, I'm going to text wrap it so I can just move maneuver uh, other things around it as well. Because I said we need two different ways. So the only other way you can do this, because you can't change the mass, right? You can't change the weight here or the force. You can change the lever arm distance. So we move this on to what? One, two, three, four, five, six meters. So this dude would need to go six meters on the other side. That's your second way of balancing it out. Cool. Okay, explain why it makes sense that there is uh, more than one way to make the objects balance. Well, as long as there's the same torque on either side, the objects are going to bounce. So since you can't change the actual force of them, right? You can't change, you're not changing their masses. You can change the lever arm distance in order to get them to balance. Okay, and then when it asks uh, what tools... Uh, you use to help you, and, and why did they help? Well, the tools that we use is the simulator here, which helps us determine the, all right, the force of the objects and the lever arm distance. So the simulator helps us out because it tells us the force and the lever arm distances, so we can kind of maneuver everything else around to make sure that they're uh, they're balanced. Number two, make two different mass objects balance in at least two different ways. Okay, so they ask us to do the same, pretty much the same thing here. Except now two different mass objects. Okay, so let's let's reset it. Let's get rid of the columns. Now we have, we're going to use a, a 5 kilogram and a 10 kilogram. All right, and again, we can just call them Newton. So 5 Newton, 10 Newton. Okay. Let's say I put the 10 Newton guy right off the first mark. How far away is the 10 Newton guy from the pivot point? It's 1 meter. So 10 times 1 is going to give me a value of 10 Newton meters worth of torque. So that means I need to have 10 Newton meters of torque on the other side in the opposite, right? So what is 5 times, or what times 5 is going to give us 10? 2. So I'm going to place this not here, but the second one away. And now they were balanced. So same, same thing. You would screenshot and, and paste. So knowing this... Getting the idea of this, the torques have to equal each other out. If I put this dude over here, and I put the, let's say I put this guy now at 2 meters. What's 10 times 2? 20. So 20 divided by 5 is going to tell me how far exactly I need to place this. 20 divided by 5 would be 4. So I would need to place this not not at the second meter, third meter, but the fourth one. And now I have 20, essentially 20 newton meters of torque on one end and 20 newton meters on the other. So you would, again, guys, take picture, screenshot, and attach. Uh, and explain my, why it makes sense that there's more one, more than one way to balance the objects. All right, well, you're, you're changing... The lever arm distances and you have differing masses but as long as all right the combination of the two on one end equals the combination or the product of the two on the other you're going to wind up having rotational equilibrium so you can multiply your force times lever arm distance 
on this end, and it can equal force times lever arm distance on this end. Again, same tools that you used. All right, we used the simulator here, at, which gave us, which tells us the masses and the, the distance. All right, tells us the force and lever arm distance. All right, then test your understanding. Open the balance lab screen. And use some different objects and masses to apply your ideas. Can you make two same mass objects balance in at least two different ways? Well, yeah. So we're going to go to the balance lab next. Let's reset that. And then let's get rid of this, and we have our our seesaw here. And again, what did it want? It wanted two same mass, two same mass objects balanced in at least two different ways. Okay. So you can use a five and a five, a ten and a ten. If I put the ten here and the ten over here, they're balanced. If I put a 15 all the way out there and over here, they're balanced. So it doesn't matter. As long as the t is, if the two objects have the same mass, which is going to give us the same force, they have to be the same distance away from the pivot point. And so you would essentially show that. All right, you can use 15 and 15. You can use the 5 and 5, a 10 and 10, but as long as they're equally distant from your pivot point, you're going to wind up with a completely balanced seesaw. So you're going to show the two different pictures that way. How did your explanations and tool use from uh, tool use ideas from number one help you? What the hell was number one again? Yeah, it's the same idea. Um, knowing that you have all right the tools to tell you the same mass. And your tick marks tell you that it needs to be the same distance away, right? Because if you, if you try putting it here, it doesn't balance. If you put it too far out, still doesn't balance. But if you put it just right, yeah, it bounces. And now if there were no tick marks, this would be a real pain in the butt to do. But So the, the tools here help us for sure. Number four, make two different mass objects balance in at least two different ways. Okay, same same idea. Now let's let's uh, pick two different things. Let's pick a let's pick a twenty and a ten, or you know what? Now how about a five and fifteen? If I put the five Newton, 15 Newton force, right, or 15 kilogram here, one meter on this end, and I take a five kilogram piece and I put it here, it's not balanced. If I put it at two, it's not balanced. Hmm. If I put it here, it is balanced. Now you could have, you should be able to figure out where to place it in one shot based upon knowing the torque rotational all right torque on one end so this we'll call it 15 newtons right 15 newtons times the lever arm distance of one meter 15 times one is 15. so the other side has to equal 15. well if i have a five all right newton force on the other side what times five would give me 15. it'd be three so i would go ba, 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 place it here Boom. Okay, so what if, all right, so that would be like one way you can take a picture. Now, if I said, okay, well, what if I put the 20 Newton guy on one meter? Can I balance it with the five? I could, right, because 20 times one is 20 on this end. So I would need to make sure that this guy, all right, what times five is going to give me 20? Four. One, two, three, four. You should be able to place it, boom, right off the rip. OK, 
Okay, but what if I decide to move the 20 kilogram block now to the two meter mark? 20 times two is 40. So can I balance that with the five kilogram? Well, 40 divided by five would give me what, eight? So I would need to make sure that there's enough room, enough tick marks to put that in, right? So we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And yeah, it's going to balance out. Now I can get rid of this dude and then put something else, right? I could put, um, hmm, well, 40. I have 40 over here. 40 divided by 10 would give me 4. So if I place this 10 Newton block here at 4, it can balance. What about the 15 kilogram? Can I put this anywhere on here on these even tick marks to get it to balance? Well, no, because, all right, this is going up by 20s. Well, actually, wait, we could. Let's see. 20. At, well, where the 20 is right this second, we can't because 15 times 1 is 15, 15 times 2 is 30, 15 times 3 is 45, 15 times 4 is 60. So if I put that here, I have 60 on this side. I don't have 60 over here. I only have 40. But now if I take 20 and move it to the third spot because 20 times 3 would give me 60, now you're going to wind up getting the object balanced. So any one of those different combinations, and then you place the images down. How did your explanation and tool use? Okay, well, from number two, what was it? Explain why there's more than one way to get these things to balance. Again, how did your explanations and tool use ideas from number two help you? Knowing the different forces and lever arm distances, you can figure out another combination of that same value. So I knew, okay, 15 times four is 60. All right, well, 20 times three is 60. If I got rid of that and used the 10, I could place this at one, two, three, four, five, six, and we should balance this out. So by knowing the values, all right, of different masses, or knowing the value of different masses and their distances away, you can get different combinations to provide equal torques on either end. And again, that would be kind of what you would write in there. Okay, then it says, okay, Use this to help with a couple different challenges. Placing a single mass on one side with two other masses. Show at least two experiments. Okay, so if we know that this side is 60. Hmm. Five times... Let's see, let's do this, right? Five times two is 10. So we have 60 on one side, 10 on the other. We need a total of 50. So if I put the 10 kilograms at five meters, right? One, two, three, four, five. We should have 50 and 10. And now 50 and 10 on this side is going to equal the 60 over here. So this could be one way you can do it. Take a picture. A lot of this guy's, I mean, you can play around with it, but if you, as long as you know the numbers, this is, makes it a lot easier, and you can kind of go through this a lot quicker. All right, so two different combinations, and what strategies did you use? So it's, again, the same, same idea. Knowing the force value and the distances, all right, add them together on one side is going to produce you a, a certain torque of a certain clockwise torque. And if that is going to equal the value over here, okay, we are going to have this thing balanced. Number six, consider this situation without using a simulation. Predict what would happen 
if we were to remove these clamps and explain your reasoning. Okay, so predict what would happen if this 80 kilogram person was a little bit farther from the pivot point and explain your reasoning. Okay, well, how far away is he? He's pivot points here, one, two, three meters. Three times 80 would be 240. This person is 30, so how far away are they? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. They're eight meters away, so 30 times eight, 240. So right now, if we took away these columns, they would balance. They're asking, or they said predict what would happen if we remove those things. Whoops. So yeah, they should, be, they should be balanced. They would have the same torque on either side. Okay, predict what would happen if this person moves a little bit farther to the right. If they move any farther to the right, this thing's going to rotate. All right, it's going to rotate uh, towards the right side. What would happen if the child moved a little bit farther to the right? Well, if they move any farther to the right, they're decreasing their torque. And so, again, it's going to rotate in the direction towards the man or towards the adult. And then test your predictions. So then you can go in and, and move these things. You can then see that it should be balanced. Then you slide this guy over one or two and see what happens. Put them back to the original position of three. Take the kid, move them in one or two and see what happens again. Okay, and then essentially what are some rules that you could use to make predictions for other situations where maxes are on a balance? If you know the torque of one, all right, if you know the torque on one side, you can figure out the torque on the other if you know one of the other two things. If you know, all right, how far they need to be or their mass. So like in the homework before, uh, or the homework from yesterday, when you know three out of the four variables, you can solve for the remaining piece. All right, the torque on one side has got to equal the torque on the other. So if you know, right, like if we knew what the girl's distance was and her and her mass, her force here, her weight, we know that this side is going to be a certain number, then and that this side would have to equal it. And if we knew one of these two, we could solve for the missing piece, which is what you're going to do. All right, um, down here where you have to try and determine um, these mystery objects. All right, so select three of them out of these. So where the hell are they? I don't see any mystery objects. Oh, I do now. Click over here, you can get people, and then we can get mystery objects. So let's clear this piece out. Let's get this going. And let's just say, let's pick A. Okay, A is, we're putting it at one meter. So we know we, don't, we only have one variable currently. All right, the force of this guy or its mass, however they're doing it on the simulation. So we can't use another mystery box. We have to know, have something of a known value. All right, so you can pick 10, you can pick 20. Okay, if I put this 10 Newton, 10 kilogram object here, it's not balanced. Okay, so you could try a different mass. Nope. Nope. You can try 20. Okay, that works. So by placing, and then you can basically take a picture of it, and then in your explanation, by taking a known 20 kilogram object, placing it one meter, and having the unknown mass placed exactly one meter, the only way for it to be balanced is if it had the same mass. So that is one way you can do it. And another way would be, Let's say I put the 10 kilogram object over here. I know the mass and I know the distance, right? So I know the force and lever arm. 10 times 2, 20 on this side. 
So that means we have to have 20 on the other side. And if it's only at position one, one meter, that means this guy, this value would have to be 20. So there's another way you can, there's other ways that yeah, you can figure that out. Okay. And so that would be, guys, what you uh, need to do. I mean, if you did another one real quick, just because it's a guessing game. I don't know. Like uh, G looks, G looks like a nice little present. Let's get, let's use G. Put G at position two. Okay. Well, this 10 kilogram object is currently at position two meters. So I have 20 on this side. This side definitely has more. So let's move it over here. Now I have 30. 40, and that's starting to move, okay, 50, and, okay, it balances out, so I have 10 kilograms on this end, all right, at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 meters away, so 10 times 5 is 50, this object over here is at position 2, so 50 divided by 2 would mean G would have to be 25, Okay, so ooh, that would have been a real pain in the butt if we did that. If we put the this guy right here at at, at one, All right? If we put the twenty here, no, nah, it's not balanced. And then you're oh jeez, now it's a pain in the ass. Let's move it over, it's too much. So then you would maybe like, all right, well, if I if this we already know it's twenty five, right? But if I put this here. This is only 20 because it's 10 times one, two meters away. But if we put the five here, five times one is another five. So five times one is five plus 10 times two is 20, 25 on this side. And that means that G would have to be 25. So that, that is another way you could go about doing this. Okay, so the guys, that is your objective for the day is to make sure that you go Okay, get the lab completed and the yesterday's homework uh, submitted. Okay.